She was like, funny you say that because I've got these great ideas. <laughs> and sure enough, two years later, we're seeing all of these amazing ideas on the wall. Um, I'm so proud to have gotten to work with her. So thank you guys all um, for coming out and please give a very warm welcome to Pam Covey. all for coming here tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm honored by each and every one of you being here. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. And I also want to say um, thank you to the Holter, Renee and Chris Ricardo, who I haven't even met yet, but I know he's here somewhere. And then um, my family, um, my sister flew here from Michigan, and our son and his fiance came from LA. Our other son, who's been very supportive and you know he's very busy, so for him to take time out from his busy life, and of course my husband, who's hiding back there because he doesn't ever want any attention. Uh, Byron, <laughs> I just wanted to say, I know. Well, okay. So, um, um, so, and also I just wanted to say that um, there is a catalog that you may have seen, and. Um, it, it took a long time to make that catalog, not just the work, but um, I had a lot of help um, from professionals. So Kathy um, Carely Paoli, I hope I said that correctly. Where are you? There she is, standing back there. And then Michael Wilder, um, I just have to thank both of you. And then John Lodge, who was with Artcraft Printers. Um, they were just so instrumental in making this catalog come to fruition and a lot of, um, you know, pins and needles moments, uh, trying to produce this over the holiday um, when our deadline had been pushed, um, you know, so close to the time of the show after our house burned down, I didn't know if I even have a catalog. So without their help, it would simply not be here. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so I, I don't want to take a lot of time talking to myself. I, I want you to have a lot of time to ask questions because I find that you know, I could talk all day, but it's not very interesting. And you all have great questions that make me think. And I, I love feedback. I want to know how you're feeling about what you see. So I briefly, um, I want to talk about the title. Um, pretty early on, maybe about two years ago, um, when, when I did speak with Renee, um, I started to create this work and think about the process of abstraction. And on its surface, all of you know this. I mean, you, if you've had children who've dabbled with paint or whatever, you know that that could be called abstraction as well, and it is. So what's the difference between that and what we're doing as adults? And you sort of, as an adult who maybe isn't aware, uh, familiar with abstract art, you may think, well, gosh, my three-year-old could do that, and I've heard that comment before on Facebook. <laughs> and I actually thanked that person, and I said, you know, that is the greatest compliment you could give me. That's not what they wanted me to say. I'm sure they were hoping that I would get really mad or something, but actually it was the best comment. Um, and the reason is that I realize now as an adult and having gone through many different types of painting, installation and sculpture and printmaking and everything else that you can possibly do, um, that this just happens to be um, probably the most challenging way to, for me to express myself. Um, and so the title simply not what that means is that life and art are intertwined. Um, I feel like whatever is happening in my life, whether I realize it or not, if I'm successful as an artist, I want it to be showing in my art. And if my life changes, then I, I expect that my art will change. And if there's not that um, synchronicity between life and art, then I often think to myself, what am I not doing? So I'm always looking for this correlation between art and life. Life doesn't stay the same. And then, and that's when you look around this room, you're seeing art that looks different in many ways. There's different mediums and different ways of working, but that's because I don't want to be bored. And I think if I, um, if I catch myself repeating something, I often get bored and that's why I work in four mediums and that's why you see a lot of diversity here. But in the end, um, they are all me. And um, so simply not means that it's simply not simple, um, it's simply not predictable, and um, it's not straightforward and it's not easy. 
and the same is true with life. So that's how I correlate the title with uh, this show. Um, just a little history. Um, I remember way back to when I was five, and uh, I, I remember saying to my mom or my dad that when I grew up, I wanted to be an artist and a mom. And um, I, I always loved to draw horses and things like that. And then when I was 18, um, my sister, who was four years older, went off to school, and she became a bacteriologist. And my parents were pretty happy about that. <laughs> so I kind of, what? Yeah, she's my sister, <laughs> Donna, in the front. So, it, you know, she, she was really hard to follow in her footsteps because, um, you know, I saw how happy my parents were, and here I was. I loved art, but, you know, I could see that, uh, I don't know that art's going to cut it. So I decided to, to do something that I didn't think I was very good at. Uh, I wanted the challenge, so I became, I went into biochemistry. Um, um, so that's kind of good and bad because uh, the good thing is I met my husband, the bad thing is I almost had a nervous breakdown. Um, so then I got married and had kids, and um, I decided that uh, what I really wanted to do was be home with the boys. That was pretty special. I felt really fortunate that I could do that, and uh, Byron has always been so supportive to me to do that. So really, this show <coughs> is here because he believed in me and encouraged me, and I can't I can't tell you what that has meant for me. I always tell him, you know, Byron, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> Forget the art. Um, so I, I have endless gratitude for him. Um, so for 20 years, I, I brought up the, the boys. Um, we have two boys, and I also painted at home. And I was self-taught. And then after 20 years, I felt like I hit a plateau. I had grown a lot. I started in the watercolor medium, and I loved it. Um, I had some success, and but for whatever reason, I, I hit a wall. Like I, I just wasn't growing anymore, and I didn't know why. So I stopped painting for about 10 years. I never picked up a paintbrush. Um, and then finally I got a book um, that kind of got me out of that, and I uh, started to paint again, and I got excited. Well, the boys were leaving the house, they were growing, and um, I decided to uh, get, go back to school. So I went to the University uh, School of Art, and um, I, um, I started just taking a few classes, and I started with art history, and then I um, decided that I wanted to get my MFA. So by 2010, I got my MFA. Um, so the first degree was biochemistry, the second one was um, MFA. Um, that was 2010. And so um, the exhibitions I did shortly after that time were very um, science-oriented, and so I uh, had this close association with Rocky Mountain Lab, and so thank you to all, all you wonderful scientists who are here tonight um, to support me. Um, I think those exhibitions were very different from this show, but I wanted to say that this exhibition is not about science. <laughs> In case you didn't notice that, these, um, to me, the scientific ones were important because they were, yes, they were a part of me. And I, I, I think of them as more of a catharsis because um, of my past, and I, um, because I had such a, you know, a hard time going through school. Um, it, it was a way to stay in touch with that part of me, but it was also a way to purge it from me and feel like I have done my job in the world of science. Now I can move on to what I hope is going to be a different way of expressing myself. So everything you see here is me in a different way. They're a different slice of who I am, um, a different time period. Um, I hope you see emotion. Um, I hope you see that I love color and that I love line and mark making, um, that I, I'm very gestural. Um, I'm not very minimalist, although um, when I heard less is more from my professors, I did not understand that, and I'm starting to now. <laughs> it took me a really long time. I was like, well, isn't more more? Um, <laughs> So I, that's why a lot of my work has a lot of marks, and I think as I keep growing, maybe less is more will be more meaningful to me. But um, just a little bit about the process of abstraction, too, and the way that I work. Um, I, uh, this body of work, um, I'm basically starting with a blank canvas or a panel or a piece of paper. There's nothing in front of me. Um, it's more of a conversation between me and the colors that I'm working with, um, 
what what medium? I mean, how I'm feeling that day determines what medium. Do I go to the encaustic? Do I go to the encaustic on paper? Do I go to um, the cold wax and oil? Do I play around with mixed media and acrylic? Well, it depends on how I feel, and it doesn't matter. I think that's the, the bottom line. When I started this exhibition, my goal was to challenge myself and see, could I produce a 2,300 square foot exhibition with four mediums and make it look like it came from one person instead of 10? I wasn't sure. I had my doubts, but I, um, I felt that that was a really great challenge. And so I was plugging along, and then all of a sudden, um, in July, um, uh, a lot of you know that our, our home burned down in the Roaring Line fire. Um, I, at that time, I had four studios because, like I mentioned, the boys had left the house. So, of course, I took over their rooms, and I had four, four humming studios. I had one devoted to encaustic, one uh, devoted to monotype. I painted in the living room. Um, I mean, I just, every nook and cranny, I just invaded it. And, um, but things were going great, and uh, when the fire came, uh, we had 45 minutes. Uh, luckily, our older son and uh, my sister-in-law, my husband were home, and you know they they didn't think about what they needed to take. They they all focused on the paintings, and so that's why so much is here. Although I did lose, you know, quite a lot as well. Um, I then rented a studio for for two months. Um, the next two months, right after the fire, um, was in a really important time for me. Um, just dealing with the emotions of and the loss of everything, you know, my studio space, my materials, my panels that were ready to be painted on, they hadn't, didn't even have a gesso on there yet. Some were started and I lost a nine foot by six foot piece that was in progress. And so for me, it was kind of like, what can I do to, uh, you know, what do I have? First of all, didn't have anything. So when I rented the studio, I got some hot plates and I, I started to do all the work in this corner here. All this work here is post-fire. Just so you know, this is devoted to that period of time, probably two months when I made all of this work. It was a frenzy. Um, if you feel the energy from the stroke, the mark making, it's because it is a process that's very spontaneous. There is, you've got one shot to kind of do it. It's not, unlike the paintings around here, it's not layer upon layer. It's not adding and subtracting. Although you can do a little bit of adding, you really cannot subtract. So once it's there, it's there. And these are these are hand pressed onto the paper. It, even though they're called monotypes or encaustic on paper, um, they are not run through press. So I just want to make that clear because when you hear the word monotype, you think of printmaking. But these are um, they're use a baron with your hand. You can selectively press in whatever colors you want onto the paper. I made my own paints. I had to start over. I had no colors. I ordered my dry pigments. Um, I started to make the wax and I started to paint. So that's where that came from. And uh, so uh, basically, this is uh, this is what came out of the two years that I worked. And I have to say, I thought, what would have happened if I hadn't lost? What if, would have happened if the fire hadn't happened and we hadn't lost our home, and et cetera? I know the show would have been different because my goal was to have a lot of you know, very large scale pieces like this. But on the other hand, I don't think it would have been as powerful. I think the work I did in this very short period of time um, became a, a really important part of this exhibit, which I had no idea. I had no idea what would happen, but when I did it, I knew that it was going to add something to this exhibit that maybe was lacking. So I just hope you enjoy the show, and uh, are there any questions? I just hope, thank you for being here. <laughs> any question? <laughs> this is the fun part. <laughs> yes? I have a question. Um, I was noticing before I knew that you had done these after the fire, but I was really enjoying um, the ones that you had used the wax on the paper and how it fused with it differently than it did on your uh, board pieces and that kind of thing. Right. Do you, is there something about one or the other that you like better to do? Yeah, they're really different processes. The uh, 
let's call them encaustic on paper or encaustic monotype. They're kind of two ways that they're talked about. And yes, they're very different from over here. These are encaustic on panel. So when you have a uh, hot wax on a board, very different from um, what I'm doing on this side is I'm drawing with wax on hot plates. And their hot plates are all on a thermostat control temperature about 165 degrees, and, and you have to keep it that way. If you go too hot, the wax is run too fast. If it's too low, the, the wax won't even melt. So um, I made my own waxes, and they have uh, pigment. They're about 50% <coughs> pigment and 50% beeswax, and then I put them into a mold. And so I draw with them on a hot plate. They melt. And then I take tools, various tools that are um, to push the wax around and um, and then when I'm happy with the design, I take the rice paper, which is very thin, and it can be a little unwieldy. There's a picture in the catalog of me with a very large sheet of paper. I'm trying to manage through this um, on my own, and sometimes I need help because it's a really large one. But in, in you lay it, um, uh, I mean, the trick of it is, number one, the image is, you have to be happy with what you have because you're not going to you know, you're not going to be able to change it. And then when you lay the paper down, if it's, it's not completely in line with the edges of your plate, it's going to be not going to look right. So there's that. Um, and then when you pull it off, you know, you look at it and you determine what side you like better. Um, in the case of the triptych, I had an idea of what I wanted, so I knew I wanted this big kind of broken cylindrical type thing. Um, and I did that on three sheets of paper. The difference is that I know I've got one shot to do this. I, the encaustic on panel, I know I have a chance to change it. There's a lot of addition and subtraction, and I'm using a razor blade to scrape things off, and it's a multimedia process. So that's more in line with what I normally do. The encaustic on paper is something that, when I first tried it, I just knew I loved the gestural quality. I love mark making. Mark making is not as easy in these other mediums sometimes. You're, but, but the cohesion factor that I discovered um, was really important to me that if I want this exhibition to be cohesive, then it doesn't matter what medium I'm working in. If it's encaustic on wood, if it's acrylic, if it's oil and cold wax, and I love marks, then I better figure out how to do that. If it needs adding more mineral spirits to my oils to get that gestural quality, then I better do it. So again, it's like, what's what do I love? And what I've learned over the last two years is that I love marks that are um, you know, very free and just line, line work. I had to have line in, in every piece that's here because that's who I am. Um, so this, um, this exhibit, again, is a very introspective way of trying to figure out what it is I love. But I don't, as I continue to paint, I will continue to find out more about who I am. And so that's a great question. Thank you. So on that picture directly behind you, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because that's what I'm seeing now. <laughs> okay. um, I see those those bubbles. Do you see them moving up or moving down? You mean these? Yeah. What do you see? Do you see them moving? When you look at that? Yeah, there's movement. Which um, way? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question because if I answer that question, um, I have to reveal something to you. And that is that this painting used to be upside down, or right side up. I mean, this used to be the top. So when you say which is where is it going, it depends on which way you're painting it. Uh, I, as a lot of artists here know, um, if a painting really is successful, if it's going to work, it needs to work no matter how you hang it, right? Um, because that means it has balance. So if I were to flip this over and it looked imbalanced, and, and that's something I would do before I hang it in a museum show. Um, I would want to correct that anyways, but in answer to Michael's question, and that is a really good question, um, what's more, it's not more, it's not really a question of like, uh, what direction are they going? I think you can see that some are pointed down and some are pointed up, and that's for variety. So there's repetition of this shape, there's variation in size, there's variation in color, which means there's variation in value, because color is value. I try to see color in terms of value. But repetition is very important for unity. So um, the fact that some of these almost fade to the background is on purpose because I don't want everything to be high contrast. I want to, as an artist, hopefully show you where I want you to look. So 
So where I want you to look in any of this work is hopefully, I want you to appreciate all of the real estate of a painting. And that has taken me a long time to understand how to do that. The way that I, I see that now is obviously saturation. We've got a red here that's quite saturated as well as in this lower corner. I don't know if you can see that, but those are areas that I, um, I wanted you know, the eye to go. But I also don't want you to just sit here or to sit there. So then I use movement of the shape that repeats. And it's kind of like, to me, this became like musical stacks. It became, um, it's called sonatina because it reminded me of the rhythm and music. And I, I, I am a musician, I do that. And um, so, so this one's called Sonatina. Um, and then another one over there is called Symphonic Suite. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a good question. <laughs> Depends on how you paint it. <laughs> yes? First of all, I just want to say I think it's fabulous that you moved the podium out of the way to talk about your painting. Thank you the more. I love it. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's fantastic. I, I had a question about. Um, the fire and its impact on your artistic process. What I took from your talk is that moment of urgency. Mm -hmm. You said you have 45 minutes. Right. And yet so much of how you envisioned the show was about being methodical, planning, re really kind of establishing a sequence of what you wanted, wanted to happen until you realized that you only have a certain amount of control before something else can totally get in the way of that. Right. So I guess my question is, could you talk a little bit about urgency and has, has urgency and the need to, to move quickly at all maybe changed the way that you think about your work and the way that you approach your work? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I look at this whole corner here and I think if, if this were the only thing you saw in the entire show, you could maybe feel a different sense of energy because that's what mark making is, um, especially the diagonal. And I tend to not, I, I love the idea of horizontal and vertical lines, but you know, I realized that when you throw in these diagonals, like in that piece that's very large over there, that's called wax and oil called the weight of everything. Um, that was very much inspired by the fact that, yes, we lost everything, but every everything um, when you lose everything, it's not everything. Um, so, in answer to your question, um, I think it's, I think what it is for me is that I enjoy both types of processes and different processes. There are times when I want to get something out fast. In this case, it was an urgency because I was, uh, I, I needed to sort of like not focus, dwell on loss. I didn't want to sit there and think about all the things we lost and oh how miserable it is and you know everybody in Facebook was like oh I'm so sorry and you know but I didn't feel that way. I, I've never actually really felt that way. I felt more, I feel thankful to be an artist because only as an artist can you go into your studio and take your emotions and put them on paper or on a panel. But what medium am I going to choose, right? I could have chosen from four mediums, but it just so happens that this monotype medium, and that's why I ordered the hot plates, that was the first thing I ordered. Because I knew that if I wanted to say something like, if I wanted to express spontaneity and emotion and how I was really feeling, that was the best medium for me. So I love that, yeah, but I also love to, um, the, the um, need to discover more deeply who I am as a person can sometimes only happen through these other types of mediums where I'm digging and, you know, adding and subtracting and, and putting a painting away for 10 months because I just don't know what to do. And then in 10 months, I know, and I've discovered something about myself. So immediacy has its, has its moments, but, um, and, and I saw that this is like clear evidence of that, but it's just for me because I, I need to be challenged in so many different ways. Um, I think that's why I, I just appreciate this medium for what it is. It is a very um, a sense of urgency. And when Brandon Branches came to our house um, before the fire, uh, you know, he, he, I met with him and, and he said all the work that I was working on and in his uh, essay in the catalog, if you happen to read it, 
there's one line there that says something like when I met Pam in her studio, she was painting like, um, uh, what, what was the way that he phrased it, like her life depended on it. And it did, because um, I think in my life, I struggled so hard with number one, feeling like an artist, being able to call myself an artist, and then realizing that I am an artist, and that maybe that's what I was meant to do. Um, everything in this, in this show um, is important to me because it's sort of like a um, affirmation that maybe I finally found out who I am. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Pam, I'm really taken by the small piece in the corner there. It's so <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but you double the offer. <laughs> it's different to me because it's so dynamic. All of the forms are moving. Right. And none of the forms ever leave the space. And I think that's just wonderful. Um, I think that one for me reminds me a lot of my heritage. Um, my mother was Japanese, um, our mother was Japanese, and a lot of the, I've used Japanese title for some of the work here, um, because that is a part of me that I'm trying to incorporate into my work more, and also um, uh, that particular thing, that particular piece reminds me of carp um, in a pond, and I guess that's why I, I thought of the, we had a pond, we had fish in it, and they throw us, but um, anyways, yeah, I, I just think that um, when, that was one of the early monotypes I did, and um, again, the thing about monotype is sort of like knowing when to stop, um, because uh, anyone who's done it, you know, you can take away too much paint, or you can put too much on, and you fold the paper, and it's like, oh, crap. Um, so anyways, thank you. I, Can you talk about how Nicholas Wilton has influenced your work? Oh, big time. <laughs> if you look at my catalog, um, I almost forgot to put him in there, too. Uh, so when I knew that the show was coming up, um, my background is not as a painter. Um, it's, in fact, it's not as anything in the art world, really. Um, I, was, I loved watercolor, but like I said, I was self-taught for 20 years. And then um, when I sort of got the show with the Holter, it's like, wow, that's nice. <laughs> I'm not really a painter. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I mean, this is the honest truth. I really didn't think I could, I mean, you know, there's all this fear and anxiety, like, why did you do that? Why did you, you know, why did you say yes? Um, so then um, I knew about Nicholas Wilson for uh, a couple of years. I had taken a workshop from him in Molokai and, uh, he has this incredible way of teaching. And so he became my mentor. And I signed up for the mentorship program. I worked with him for seven months. A um, group of maybe 10 to 12 of us came around the country. And we did phone calls. We talked about art. And we um, would look at the paintings we were working on, each of us. And using Photoshop mostly, we would talk about how would you, how would you um, uh, improve on design. A lot of it's about value, and that was a new thing for me. A lot of what I learned from him, I never would have learned anywhere else. And he says the same thing. What he learned was from studying the work of masters and what makes a painting strong and what makes it compelling and what makes it one that um, you know you're you're driving a car and you're going past um, a gallery. Is it going to make you stop? You know, what's going to make you stop that car to go see that? And when I talked to him, I said, well, you know, Nick, I, I've painted for a long time. I'm not really sure if your program's for me. And he said, well, you know, your, your painting's it's good, but um, you want it to be great. <laughs> and that's what got me. And that's what I wanted. I wanted my work to get better. I don't want good. You know, I mean, who does? Um, and that's how I felt for my work. It's like, yeah, it's okay, but, you know, I really want to be, like, excited by it. And then I had another person ask me more recently, well, a good friend who was in the mentorship program, she said, well, how do you feel about your work now? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't really like it. <laughs> so now I'm stuck with, you know, i got to start all over again. And I don't know what the next body of work will be like. I mean, it's not that I don't really like this work. I do. But it's just that you move on. 
I'm not the same person I was when I did four or two years ago. I've changed. So, um, again, I, I think I just want to know who I am now. And as I get older and, you know, can't walk anymore with a cane, I can't imagine what my work will be like then. I don't know. But um, because, again, art and life are so intertwined, and that's what Nick is all about. So if any of you are interested in, in who she's talking about, nicholaswilton.com, I, I so uh, admire him, and now I'm going to be working on his team to help his artists in this program to hopefully um, make their design stronger. Have you worked with him? Um, I saw something on your blog a few, several months ago and went on his website and signed up for his um, mini workshops. Oh, good. And I'm finding that he talks about art in a totally different way than any other right. um, anybody offering instruction in art does. And it's really refreshing. It was refreshing to me, too. I agree. So thanks for bringing that up. Yes. I have a question for him. You have the, the four different kind of mediums here. Um, and they have very different geometries mm -hmm. to them. Um, you know, the paintings, they seem to have more geometric shapes and they get looser and different things. When you start something, do you, do you go in and say, oh, I'm going to work on an acrylic today. Uh, how do you move from one to another? From one medium to another? Right. And uh, do you do that sort of simultaneously? Yeah. That's one thing that with Nick, um, when I did the mentorship program, he wanted us to work on 10 panels simultaneously. They were all whatever size. It didn't matter. But it was 36 by 36. You had 10 of them. And in my case, um, Several of the ones along this wall um, are from the mentorship program, and so they came from that uh, experience in working with Nick. Um, so um, the process is always the same, unless you're talking about the monotype, because that's the one that is more spontaneous. But any other form of medium, whether it's oils, acrylic, or kind of collage, um, um, mixed media, my process is I start without anything in mind. I keep putting on paint, and to to emphasize that, um, there's a story about uh, younger son, Evan, and his fiance, and I think, oh, they're gonna start laughing. Um, it was Thanksgiving, and, and again, I was preparing for the show, and I was in the midst of this mentorship program, and I had all these panels, and it's like, oh my gosh, I had to load on so much paint, because it's like, more paint, more paint, more paint. And I'm like, well, okay, so I, I basically said to them, you guys grab some paint, here are the panels, I don't care what you do, just like, they're bottles and they have, you know, chips. Just turn them upside down, I don't care what color you have, just throw it on there. So they did. And I, I kind of left the room. You know, I gave them an apron, but I left the room. And I was watching what they were doing and I came back and I <laughs> literally, <laughs> there's some shock value to what I saw because um, there were colors that I went to normally use and these bright turquoise and it's like, whoa. Um, and something happens when you that um, it's not your work and it's not work that you would color you'd normally use and um, every every cell in your body is like no <laughs> I didn't tell you guys that but, um, I, in fact I was really encouraged and like great job That's really good thank you and then and then they left and they left on the airplane and it was like I, I couldn't help but just get out my paint and cover it up <laughs> But I, I thought of this, that whole thing, and it's like, you know, now I want, I wanted my kids to come, and like, it's like, I don't care what you do, just do it. In fact, anybody here who wants to come to Hamilton, <laughs> throw paint on my panels, you're helping me. Um, um, the painting that's third from the left here is one Evan worked on. There's a little bit of that turquoise color that it was all over everything. And then this is one that Abigail worked on. You can see there, she did this really cool red circle, and she's really happy with it. <laughs> I would have loved that too, but you know, yeah. as I kept working on it and scraping it back and everything, it kind of just disappeared. And I didn't want to tell her that that was her painting anymore, but, <laughs> but you have to know that, okay, so I did have a little help, but um, that's my process. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Please, let's give her another round. Um, because of the catalog, 
hands. I just want to tell you that to put on an exhibition like this under the holster, um, and, and they they uh, have done so much to, as you can see, there's a lot of work that goes into any exhibition. And they have three going on right now. They've got you know, multiple things going on. If you purchase a catalog, I want you to know that that really, really helps them. Um, they don't always have catalogs, but um, in this case, they have invested a lot um, in me, in the show, um, in future exhibitions. So by purchasing a catalog, um, they just want you to know that that really does help both them, helps me, of course. But um, I, I just want you to know that I appreciate you. So, and I'm happy to sign one, <laughs> or two, or five.